Hey everyone, Crisis here. Considering we seem to be actually getting some No Way Home merchandise after the movie's already been out for over a year, and with the potential of any of the three live-action Spider-Men appearing in Across the Spider-Verse soon, today I'm going to do a deep dive on the amazing Peter 3's strength, speed, powers, and abilities. For the sake of comprehensiveness and to make this the ultimate Amazing Spider-Man video, I will be considering all of the video game and tie-in comic material, even if the games, for instance, are in a separate continuity from the movies. Essentially, The Amazing Spider-Man 1, the infinite cinematic comic bridging the first two movies, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and any guidebooks or behind-the-scenes commentaries are what compromises the main canon that would inform Andrew's appearance as of No Way Home. The video games being either the mobile phone, 3DS, or home console versions of The Amazing Spider-Man 1 or 2 games are set in a different continuity, as stated by the game's developers, and they obviously adapt the events of the movies in ways that differ from the films or make choices in their stories that contradict the events of the theatrical versions. For example, Alistair Smythe appears in The Amazing Spider-Man 1 game as a supervillain who eventually loses the use of his legs, whereas in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 movie, he's just kind of a jerk who can walk around just fine. Or the Rhino, who was stated to be a genetically modified modified human similar to the lizard, but becomes a mech donning man in a suit in the TASM 2 film. Safe to say these games contradict the movies pretty frequently, and are stated to just be in a separate continuity. Nonetheless, I will be including feats from the games for the sake of entertainment, and perhaps as insight into the potential of the main version of this adaptation of Spider-Man, as they all do stem from the same point, that being the first TASM movie. With all that said, let's take a look at the amazing Spider-Man. But before we continue, let me introduce the sponsor of today's video, Mech Arena. Fighting giant robots is a pretty common topic on my channel, so it stands to reason that I've been enjoying my time playing Mech Arena. Mech Arena is a PvP shooter for mobile and PC, allowing players to pilot giant robots and battle it out in massive arenas. You can get this awesome game by either clicking the link below or use this QR code on screen to get a $30 valued starter pack for free. And if you're fast, you can even add me to your friends list and play some matches alongside me on either mobile or PC. And now, back to the video. This series of films initially tackled adapting the wall crawler in a much more grounded and down-to-earth way when compared to the character's last cinematic outing, and this is reflected in his feats in his first film. We see that even as a burgeoning web-slinger, Spider-Man is easily capable of overpowering peak human beings, such as a squad of trained SWAT officers. And against the Lizard, we see the hero withstand getting launched and tossed through walls many times. Unfortunately, as stated and shown throughout the movie, Connors is the physically superior being when compared to Spider-Man, at least for now. And, and I'm sure in the back of her mind, if she doesn't get the antidote, who knows what the lizard will do to her boyfriend. It's clearly that he's stronger. Which is pretty evident as the lizard was overpowering him in their first fight in the high school and left Peter severely worse for wear after the sewer and still had Peter pretty much dead to rights in the final battle, who needed help from Captain Stacy to freeze lizard rather than overpower him outright. Sure, Peter was wounded before the final fight, but the two bouts he had with Connors prior show that it really wouldn't have made that much of a difference either way. This all makes sense seeing as in the Amazing Spider-Man tie-in comic, Lizard was seen tossing around and destroying cars, yielding anywhere between 132 million joules or 70 billion joules depending on how you calculate it. Either way, it makes sense why Lizard would be far stronger than Spider-Man at this point seeing as the latter's feats are at best six times less impressive than the Lizard's. Although in the TASM 1 game for mobile Java devices, Sandman appears in a version of this universe and destroys two cars at once with a single attack, and Spider-Man does manage to defeat him and even scale to his giant form, this feat actually landing within the same range as the low end for Lizard's feet on the bridge. However, 
This game is on the far edges of the Tasm verse, as it includes an alternate version of the first movie's events where Venom shows up to help Lizard, which obviously wasn't in the movie, with Spider-Man knowing the identity of Eddie Brock, as well as what a symbiote is, despite it being like his first week as a superhero. And he doesn't even work at the Daily Bugle until the second movie, so there's really no way he should know who Eddie Brock is. So it's safe to say, for sure, that the main Andrew Spidey is safely within wall levels of power and weaker than the lizard. Now you might be wondering why I'm doing such a bad job of hyping this man up, but how poorly he does against Lizard here will only make this Spider-Man that much more impressive later on. In the first TASM console games set months after the events of the first movie, one of Oscorp's Spider Slayer mechs generated an earthquake just by breaching the surface. It's hard to judge the exact scale here, but considering that people all throughout Manhattan were talking about it on not Twitter, it'd likely fall somewhere around a magnitude 3 earthquake as it was felt and noticed by many people but didn't seem to do much structural damage to the surrounding buildings or terrain, aside from the hole in the ground it created when it literally burrowed up from out of it. Although one guy blames his house being damaged on the mech, and if attributed to the earthquake itself, this could be around a magnitude 8 quake, based on the standards of said earthquakes. And seeing as this mech generated this amount of energy just by moving through the earth, and is obviously undamaged by doing so, it would be able to endure up to 15 megatons of force, or the energy required to demolish an entire city, with Spider-Man being able to punch the robot's lights out and damage its targeting system, which, like I said, were capable of withstanding earthquakes it was generating itself. While the events of the games aren't canon to the movies, the events of the first TASM movie is canon to this game. So the main Andrew Garfield Spider-Man has the potential to go from wall level in his first movie to anywhere between building or city level in a matter of months. That's over a billion times more powerful, but it doesn't stop there. Throughout the game's events, Spider-Man defeats Scorpion, someone stated to be twice as strong as Spider-Man, and implied to have some measure of a symbiote empowering him, a reference to Scorpion's tenure as Venom in the comics. Spidey's able to combat and ultimately put away Scorpion, meaning he either got twice as strong during the events of the game, or Spidey's just stronger than Scorpion outright. He also defeats many other cross-species supervillains akin to the Lizard, like the super-strong Rhino, the Iguana, Vermin, the Aquatic Natty, and again battling the Lizard himself, managing to cure him. Just before this though, Spider-Man and Lizard 2v1'd Alistair Smythe, or this non-canon version of Ryan from The Office, and managed to pull apart his super suit, stated in the game's description to be made of vibranium. Now, obviously, just like how different versions of the same characters throughout different universes can all have different strength levels, the same can be said of this version of Vibranium when compared to the MCU or the main comics. Still though, whoever wrote this was a massive fan of Spider-Man. Imagine Andrew being able to just rip Captain America's shield in half or Black Panther's suit. Yeah, alright. In the Infinite Cinematic comic, which should act as an explanation of how Andrew got his new suit for both the movie and game timelines, Spider-Man falls into a jet engine and survives. With his costume left in tatters, he'd have Gwen give pointers on designing his new one. Moving into the TASM 2 era, Peter's been a superhero for a couple of years now, and he's at the top of his game. Pretty much everyone involved from VFX supervisors, producers, weird foreign yet official guidebooks, Andrew Garfield, and Mark Webb himself, they all say that Parker's come a long way since seeing him in the first movie, and that he's essentially mastered his abilities as Spider-Man. And there's a quality of joy to everything he does, unlike some more brooding superheroes or... He also the feeling he's, he's come a long way since you saw him in the last movie. For sure. He's actually really good at being Spider-Man right now. On this movie, Spider-Man basically has become a virtuoso of all his skills. He's stronger, faster, and as skilled as he's ever been up until now. Yet, he's still the underdog, as Electro is stated to be far more powerful than Spider-Man himself. Although that doesn't mean the webhead doesn't perform anything impressive against a being who might as well be a literal god. By the movie's finale, Dylan is just laying into Spider-Man, with the effects of his power stated to affect your bones, your muscles, and your organs. 
all at once, and Spidey is ultimately left standing after all of this. This is impressive, as we can actually see Electro's voltage and amp output on the meter attached to his head, with the average power level here being within the range of city block level. So basically, even Andrew's organs and bones can sustain forces within the ranges of 100 tons of force. After being bombarded by this level of energy and saved by Gwen against Electro, Spider-Man manages to pretty quickly knock out his version of the Green Goblin, yet not fast enough still as he suffers the biggest loss of his life. In the Amazing Spider-Man 2 console and mobile games, which again, are totally different versions of events, he also manages to defeat both Venom and Carnage. At least the latter of the two man-made symbiotes use nanobots to increase one's strength and healing factors, with Spider-Man utilizing his commandeered sonic gauntlets taken from Shocker, as well as nearby flamethrowers to defeat Cletus Cassidy, taking advantage of the symbiote's weaknesses. From this point forward in the canon movie timeline, it's likely that The Amazing Spider-Man has been an active superhero for some part of 10 years. Given the first movie's release date and making the safe assumption that it's set when it's released, and then accounting for No Way Home taking place in late 2024 in the MCU, this Peter would be around 28 years old. We have statements from the film's crew that none of the Spider-Men were de-aged, and the real-world passage of time was in effect. So this Peter would have experienced up to a decade of growth and power progression since the events of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and it shows. The lizard in No Way Home would have to be taken from sometime after he discovered that Peter Parker was Spider-Man during the end of the sewer fight from the first movie, at least, with the villain stating in that movie that he grows stronger every day. And it's over 12 hours later until Andrew has a rematch with the lizard in No Way Home's climax. So Connors could very well be stronger than ever seen on film. Here, after grappling for a time, Andrew is able to kick Connors off from over top him and restrain him with his webs pretty casually. Casually. Compare this to the near-death state Lizard could force his Spider-Man into multiple times in the first film, and we can see just how far he's come throughout the years. Then again, against the strongest Electro ever, powered by Iron Man tech, the Amazing Spider-Man endured a sustained lightning blast for over 30 seconds, while seemingly no worse for wear. The arc reactor which Electro is empowering himself via most resembles the Iron Man 2 era model, with that same kind of reactor outputting 200 petawatts of energy, or enough power to destroy an entire city. This is likely a low ball, as the script refers to Electro's power as Stark Grade, so he may very well be Mark 85 Iron Man level outright if it's just referring to Stark's power holistically. While we hear that Andrew's suit in TASM 2 was reasonably shockproof, as Gwen was confident she could rig a car battery to his web shooters at no risk, in fact his suit is stated to be augmented or improved by the movie's VFX team, and it seemingly has been buffed against electricity since fighting Electro the first time, seeing as it's completely undamaged when compared to TASM 2. He's still clearly hurt by and withstands Electro's attacks in that movie as well as No Way Home, so it's still a durability feat even if his suit can hold up better against lightning attacks. Finally, he's seen tanking a Raimi vs. Pumpkin Bomb alongside the other two Spider-Men. The spacing in this scene shows that Andrew's pretty close to the bomb when it explodes, and the next time we see him, he's completely undamaged. Goblin's Pumpkin Bombs have been calculated to yield at least 40 tons of TNT, or similar amounts of energy that would be required to destroy a city block. So again, energy that was deemed far stronger than him in TASM 2 in the form of Electro or another city block level character, Andrew can now completely shrug off. This is consistent again with the high end of the lizard calc I mentioned earlier, which should be appropriate given the fact that he should be stronger than ever when Andrew fights him in No Way Home. So even more to the point that city block levels of energy are well within his range of power at this point in his career. Now, an interesting point to potentially bring up is the fact that, especially if Andrew appears in Across the Spider-Verse, it was established in that movie that if you're a character from another universe, you actually start to die, your cells start to degrade the longer you're in a universe that is not your own. So all of these feats in the MCU that Andrew is committing may very well be while he is weakened, while his cells are weakening and dying off. It was stated that Into the Spider-Verse was simply another universe connected to Venom, and Venom of course is connected to the MCU, so it's honestly very likely that this rule 
may be intact. Of course, scaling to the Spider-Man of the MCU grants this wall crawler a cadre of feats that he too would benefit from, such as the halting of a strike from Cole Obsidian, the same character who could dent the Hulkbuster Mark II in Infinity War, the earlier model enduring strikes from an enraged Hulk in Age of Ultron, with the Jade Giant drawing blood from Thor in the first Avengers movie, who could prior generate country levels of energy throughout the shaking of the entire planet of Jotunheim. That equates to nearly 40 teratons of TNT. That's over 700,000 times stronger than the strongest nuclear bomb ever detonated, the SAR bomb. Now obviously, Thor and Hulk get stronger than these earlier showings they performed. I'm not saying that Andrew or any of the Spider-Men scale to peak Thor or peak Hulk, yet all the same, Andrew would be more powerful than these prior iterations of the characters, seeing as Electro especially was able to do considerable harm to the MCU Spider-Man throughout No Way home. Even towards the start of the movie, when all Tom Holland's version of the character had done up to this point was face Doc Ock while in a suit that enhances his durability, he really shouldn't be that hurt, MCU Spider-Man was still floored and dazed by a form of Electro with deteriorated energy as stated by No Way Home's chief visual effects supervisor. As Spider-Man scrambles from a searing electrical current, a wall of sound with a man's face in it shields him. So while Electro was stronger than Andrew as of Tasm 2, he still ultimately endures attacks from him even when his suit was damaged towards the climax of that movie, affecting even his muscles and bones, and he gets much stronger from that point forward. In true Spider-Man fashion, this version of the character can dodge bullets and lightning blasts, with the latter landing at around Mach 1300, or 1300 times the speed of sound. In the games, he can point-blank dodge beams fired from Oscorp drones, stated to be lasers moving at the speed of light. I'm telling you, whoever's writing these descriptions loves him some Spider-Man. He then goes on to fight and react to genetically enhanced speedsters, with Spider-Man himself saying they're moving faster than anything he'd ever seen, which would include the speed of light lasers, and Spider-Man is able to react to and defeat these speedsters in the Amazing Spider-Man 2 game, showing that he is pretty much faster than light and faster than ever. Now, I'm not saying Spider-Man can run or swing that fast, but he can dodge and throw punches at that speed. Now, a lot of people, whenever you bring up Spider-Man and speed, they go, oh, it's just his precog. Listen, bro, if Spider-Man can dodge attacks moving that fast with his precognition and can can then be tagged by people without precog. None of Spider-Man's villains really possess precog like he does, but they're still able to tag him when we know his precognition allows him to dodge attacks moving at the speed of light, and then Spider-Man can then scale to the people he's fighting. It means he moves at the speeds at which his spider sense can allow him to dodge and react to. Saying, oh, he has spider sense, that's not really a debunk to him dodging things that his spider sense allows him to dodge. His spider sense lets him dodge this stuff anyway, so why is it even worth bringing up? I have to bring it up every time I talk about Spider-Man, I don't get it, anyway. As far as this Spider-Man showings of skill and intellect, he was able to lay out and outmaneuver multiple trained SWAT officers, with even Harry Osborn managing to beat trained guards while on death's door, and obviously Spider-Man beats Green Goblin. And in the Java mobile version of TASM 2, which sees Gwen actually survive the events of the movie, strangely enough, Spider-Man battles the Tasmverse version of Mysterio, managing to push through his illusions. He takes on hand-picked agents with cutting-edge tech, Kraven, the self-proclaimed ultimate hunter who would manage to hunt down and kill pretty much all of the bosses of the first Tasm game, and was able to assess and take advantage of the much stronger Carnage's weaknesses. He can hack Oscorp's tech and even approve upon the company's web formula. As seen in the first movie, wherein he stole the web formula, it barely contains the lizard, whereas in No Way Home, it restrains him off screen for several minutes, meaning he'd have improved on the compound formulated by the most advanced company on his planet. On that same note, he was able to manufacture a cure for the lizard in a high school science lab in a completely different universe. Despite the fact that he never really cured lizard like he said he did, Gwen made the 
Nick here in Oscorp's lab. Not sure why this guy is prone to lying. So his scientific abilities also improved massively in the around 10 years he spent off screen. And finally, he stated by No Way Home's bonus features to be the most agile and acrobatic of the three cinematic Spider-Men, which I don't think many people will disagree with. That's not to say he's faster than the other two Spider-Men. I don't think that's really shown on screen, but it would mean he's more probably malleable when he's jumping around and just generally more acrobatic. The Amazing Spider-Man of course boasts the ability to stick to and climb walls, web shooters designed to be resistant to electricity. He has a precognitive sixth sense, allowing him to detect threats alongside the other two Spider-Men. When reacting through Spider-Sense, his body moves unconsciously and without thought. He's even stated to have synced up with the MCU Spider-Man by the movie's audio description. <laughs> Using their spider senses, Peter 3 throws the cure and Peter 1's hand shoots up to catch it. So he should share the same level of danger sense. In the video game timelines, he has access to a variety of suits that grant certain abilities. The relevant ones include a suit which grants Spider-Man better stealth capabilities, renders him mostly bulletproof, and nullifies electric shocks. He also gains both the Venom and Carnage symbiotes in the games, which should aid his healing factor and amplify or increase his attack power and durability, but his greatest upgrade would come in the form of an unlockable costume within the Amazing Spider-Man 1 console game, the Raimi suit. With all that said and done, the Amazing Peter 3 boasts city to country-level attack power and durability, speeds far exceeding lightning, and possibly the speed of light genius level intellect and engineering abilities, a rapid rate at which he grows stronger and improves as a crime fighter overall, and an assortment of powers, all around making him an amazing Spider-Man. Let me know if you guys would want to see either an updated Raimi-verse or MCU Spider-Man video in the future. I can never get enough about talking about Spidey. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.